y'all this is one of my favorite people <laughs> on the planet and i don't say that possessively i say that protectively v sheree williams i absolutely love and adore her owner of cuisine noir magazine and the global food and drink initiative welcome i'm so happy to have thank you. you thank you i know we got wrapped up in our pre interview conversation because I mean oh my goodness just to talk about food just gets you excited so listen that's the only way to be if the food doesn't excite me I got to exit <laughs> stage left food is my love language all of that absolutely I hear you that's so I hear you and so listen you have a lot of great things that you're doing that's uh, we're going to talk about in this interview, but to be honest, you've also done a lot of great things. So as much as this conversation is about talking about what's to come, uh, I also want to use this as an opportunity to really give you uh, your flowers, to be honest. Um, for those who may have caught a little bit of the Instagram live interview we was doing, um, I'd share that y'all know me as a podcaster, y'all know me as a PhD student that's been studying food trucks, but when it came down to writing, I really wanted to write in the public space, but I just didn't feel comfortable enough. Like I just felt a little intimidated about the whole process and how it all went down. And in 2018, when I started the Food Truck Scholar, just maybe a couple of months after that, I was following all the people that had anything to do with food, especially black food. And Cuisine Noir is one of the first places that I followed on Instagram. And soon after that, they had a week where they was focusing on black food trucks and they would tag me in the post. And I just felt so excited and so happy that someone knew who I was and they actually cared enough to like tag me in it. And it was like this big magazine. And I was just so excited. I was like, you know what, what if? Like my whole vision at the time was like, I could be like their food truck person. Like they could just bring me on. I, like, that was my vision, <laughs> like was that. So I inboxed, I was like, hey, saw that you did this week. It was great. Um, if you're ever looking for someone that could write for food trucks, I would love to do that. And Cherie was so kind to take my call, listen to me ramble for like five minutes about food trucks. And was <laughs> like, I... <laughs> and it was like, all right, I like your pitch. Uh, I want this story, this whole thing you're talking about black food trucks, you know, changing communities, get that to me. I had like, y'all, I had not written a single magazine article. We didn't know what that looked like. We didn't know what that entailed. None of that. Um, they just bought a camera, really didn't know how to take pictures with it. None of that. <laughs> and so I'm out here, I'm taking these photos, I'm having people help me. I write the story. And she was so kind, so supportive, and guided me through it. And my first two magazine articles have been with Cuisine Noir. So I want to publicly take this moment to just say thank you, Cherie, for opening the doors of Cuisine Noir, not only to just, you know, experienced and world-renowned Black food writers, but also people like little old me who just got started and you treated us with the same love, same respect, held us to the same standard of professionalism across the board, never felt like you ch you changed my voice, um, was just always supportive of me, supportive of what my vision was and always pushed me to be um, the best writer. So before we do anything, Cherie, I really want you to know how much oh, that means. Thank you, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> thank you. You know, it, it's just, it's great to be able to serve in this way um, and see just, again, those who see the vision of what we want to do the stories that we want to tell. Um, and, you know, as long as you definitely have, you know, just the good skills of writing and putting a story together and open to just, you know, teachable moments, then it's definitely just a win-win, uh, you know, combination for both of us. So thank you for just, you know, coming with the stories that you did because they were just amazing. So... Listen, and there's plenty more. So I know, the food Manati and <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow, there is a whole world of food trucks, I'm telling you. It is. And I, I got all of them, but for today, I want to get into your story. Um, there's so much that you have done. And so I just want to take a step back for a moment and learn one, how did you get into the world of digital media? 
Mm -hmm. um, and then more specifically, how did that transition into the world of Black food digital media with Cuisine Noir and all the other projects you have? Awesome. Thank you. So, um, it you know, going backwards, it was 2007. And so one of the things I'm always clear about is I am not the founder of Cuisine Noir. There's a chef named Chef Richard Purnell who's in Sacramento. His vision started around even 1998. Wow. Uh, that's when he was pioneering that. And being a chef in LA, he noticed again in, the, in a lot of the mainstream, most of the mainstream, especially white mainstream magazines, Black chefs were really not getting their flowers from what they, how they contributed, right? And so when we connected in 2007, at that time I was in, I happened to be in grad school and I've always been a writer, you know, even going back to the fifth grade, I always say, you know, I was always writing short stories and, and English was really my jam. Uh, I just really enjoyed the writing. So when he brought the opportunity to me, originally it was from a PR standpoint because uh, my degrees are in uh, communications. And so as I was looking to really get into more freelance writing myself, I said, oh, this is interesting. And he really focused it on chefs, black chefs. Mm -hmm. So we had launched it digitally because I was like, you know what? I was studying, you know, again, in grad school and studying. I was like, you know what? Digital is about to hit. This web thing is about to hit. And so um, I said, let's launch it online because there really wasn't a budget for print. I said, launch it online, grow it, and then take it into print. And so we launched um, October of 2007, uh, originally. Mm -hmm. And at that time, that was when um, Rock Harper won Hill's Kitchen, season three. The Neelys were popping up on the scene and Big Daddy won uh, Food Network Star. So we were in the Top Chef, that was season three too. Trey Wilcox was on that season. And then following that, you know, Carla Hall started having her season, Tiffany Derry. So that's when all of that started happening. And so um, when we decided to do different directions, I took it over from him um, in December of 2008 and it came under my company. And then in that January, I started rebranding it. And I said, you know what, let's do food, wine at the time, but now we do drinks so we can focus on everything. And I said, I didn't travel. Because, I mean, they all go together, right? I mean, if you're traveling, why am I, what am I going to eat here? Or I'm traveling to eat here, you know? So it makes a, bi a big decision in your, in your um, a difference in your decision making. So anyway, kick that off then September 1st, 2009 is when I, uh, so that's why we note the 12 years from the time I've owned it and kicked it off and rebranded it. And, you know, it's really been a journey. Um, of who we've come across and who we've seen grow in this industry. You know, more specifically, when you think about the chefs, again, we follow where Big Daddy is. Uh, Rock Harper's on our board. I've stayed, always stayed in touch with him. Great guy in DC with Queen Mothers. And, you know, from the wine, uh, you know, Mac McDonald's like the grandfather of wine. Met the McBride sisters when they had their very first label called Eco Love. Um, met them, you know, so just watching everyone's journey just as much as our journey along the way. And then I would say maybe, so in the 2011, we did our first print and we were in print from 2011 to 2017. Um, you know, it is a very difficult um, and that's a whole nother conversation in terms of support from advertisers and things. If you're following like Roland Martin and things, it is real. There is no support for black media. Um, and even last year with the whole reckoning, there still wasn't support for black media. Black brands did get um, support and that was great, but as black media is still not there. And so, um, you know, we, so I'm excited too, and we can to talk about our, you know, our, our special edition of our print issue, but um, you know, it's just been what, and then what we decided to do, you know, I would have to say, I got, I'm not a jealous person. So I always joke when I say this, but as we started, talking to different people and learning of their cultures, Jamaica, Cuban, um, from Trinidad, you know? And then it makes you wonder, well, what's my heritage? Mm. You know, where are we really from? Because, you know, we're, we're you know, African-American, we're black, but you know, where are those roots? And so that's really where I really started connecting the diaspora together because you know, you see that we're so much alike 
than we are, we may seem separated. And you're seeing more, as you can see, between the continent of Africa, the brothers and sisters over there with us, uh, really coming more together. I would say even more so than when I was even younger, right? Mm -hmm. You're really starting to see us come together and it's beautiful. And so, you know, that love of just brothers and all of us um, really made us open up to the diaspora to say, okay, who's doing what over here? Uh, we found that sommelier in Switzerland, that Jamaican restaurant in Berlin, you know, so it's just so I just I love it of just hearing their stories and sometimes how we all don't matter where you're born as black people, we have the same mannerisms and the same things that we've eaten at home and don't do this, you know, and there's the big debate going on between with the grits and is it salt or is it sugar, you know, and so it, it's just been fun just to again see how no matter the horrific tragedy of slavery and what it did. It's, it's still fun when you connect with brothers and sisters, it's like, wow, you know, it's just, it's a, such a fun reunion. Um, because again, what was being, you know, although we were divided, we were still culturally learning the same thing or just some things were ingrained in us. So it's been, it's been great. You're absolutely right. I was saying this to my students a couple of nights ago. I said, I don't care where in the African diaspora you go, you're going to find some variation of rice and beans. <laughs> like that, like food unites us until the great debate about sugar or salt and grits. Girl. Now for the sake of this, I could go there, but I want you to stay in my family. So <laughs> I ain't going to touch it. You don't want to know, huh? You I ain't going to touch it. I ain't going to touch it. I ain't going to touch it. Not, not right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there was something that you said about like, you know, it, gave you the opportunity to open up and figure out what people were doing in Switzerland and Berlin. And I'm pretty sure there's somebody listening like, wait a minute, we in Switzerland? Yes, we are in all the places. But what I love about Cuisine Noir for me personally is it opened my mind to what's happening. Like, for example, when you were talking about the sommeliers and I'm thinking about my limited exposure of wine was French wine, mm. Italian wine maybe some German wine, um, you know, American wine from time to time. Like that's what you see when you go into the shelves and that's what everybody is talking about. Oh, have you had Chardonnay? Have you had this? Have you had that? And never really realizing or even questioning why we don't see wines from the African diaspora, why we're not seeing South African wines, why we're not seeing, like, why are we not putting the same energy into these wines from different countries that represent the African diaspora that we're doing with our Italian wine, our French wine. And that gets into a bigger conversation about cuisines overall. When you're trained in culinary, you're trained French cuisine, Italian cuisine, the conversations about soul food being unhealthy, but we do not question the amount of pastas that we eat, which are just simply sugar. <laughs> flour and egg. We don't make those questions yet they're seen as the gold standard or when um, other cultures, we have to uh, quote unquote, elevate their food right. to a certain standard. Right. And so what I've loved about Cuisine Noir is that we're not trying to elevate anything. We're letting you know it's been here. You the one that got to elevate and elevate okay. your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And that's a good point, that whole thing of elevated into fine dining and stuff. You're still living by the European white standard. You know what I mean? Of what that means. And to your point, if I make a great dish and, and put it nicely on the plate, I've just, I've, I mean, just the presentation, I just elevated it, right? So why do I need someone to approve it to say that it is elevated? The other thing, you know, is taking back the foods. You, when you talk about, you know, soul food right yeah. and i look at what's happened to fried chicken and mm -hmm. now all of a sudden everyone wants to get into this fried chicken sandwich deal you know what i mean but of course when it was associated with black people it was negative right but then someone comes along and makes it food food chicken and whatever whatever and now it's great you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and so you know the same with like watermelon the whole negative 
connotations and just the, what you see around that. But then when you see it turn into watermelon um, water and this and that, you know what I mean? So there's just so many, to your point, so many negative things that are associated with when there's black people associated with it. And that's what I don't like. And that's what we've tried to really change through this um, is, but at the same time, we don't need your approval. This is who we are. This is our lifestyle to do what we do. We really don't need approval or not. I don't think so. You know what I mean? No. Now also I got to give it to like the Napa and Sonomas of the world because they've done an amazing job when it comes to marketing, right? And so to your point, I'm glad to see the South African and other African winemakers really just coming up on the scene and showing the wines because they're good. Um, they're excellent wines from either Seven Sisters, you got Carmen Stevens, you got Kamusha, you know, so there again, there's that perception that the wines are not good. I've heard black winemakers mm -hmm. say, you know, there's this thing around marketing and when you go to a site or you look at the marketing collateral, there's no hint that it's black on there because they don't mm -hmm. want anyone to have that perception. Well, it's black on, it must not be good. You know, mm -hmm. and I've heard that before in the past too. So they're really, you know, we've got a lot of work to do around the perceptions of the good oh, yes. used by black owned companies. Um, I remember reading an article where there was a, a luxury soap company and they went through it to where they tried to make sure that there was no spots of it being black owned. But then after a while, I was like, you know what? Hey, I'm black owned. You know, you're either gonna like it or you're not, you know? Um, and so I, I love when people get to that point of this, they bring their everybody, everything to that. It's not like they're shouting from the rooftops, I'm black, I'm black, but just putting out a good product that is um, favorable to everybody. And that's what we do here at Cuisine Noir too. You know what I mean? We put out who we, we put you put the product that we put out and everybody's welcome to enjoy it because then you're learning about different things just like i'll pick up an italian magazine and learn about you know italy and, and or germany it's no different it's no different so yeah. yeah and it's really it all comes down to exposure right that's what it comes down to and like even right now as we're having this conversation and you're listing out wines many of whom i didn't know and so right after this, I'm going to be looking them up so that I can order me some wine <laughs> and bring them to my place. So it's all about that type of exposure. And what I've loved is that the diversity in the stories you tell, not just yeah. geographically, but also who the people are. Like there's chefs, there's food truck owners, there's pop-ups. You've even had celebrities, you know, Yay. that you've covered. Awesome. Yes. So who, who's been some of your most memorable celebrities to be able to interview and, and learn the foodie side of them? You know, it, uh, we were chatting yesterday about Dr. the late Dr. Maya Angelou. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I'll be honest with you, keeping it 100, you get some people that will be like, oh, I don't want to do an interview with Cuisine Noir because maybe, you know, again, looking for white acceptance through mass media, whatever, then our publication is not for you. But then I look back and I said, okay, you know what? But we had Dr. Maya Angelou, you know, and, and, and we talked to Wendy Williams and we talked to um, Gerald Albright and just so many others, you know, uh, Yo-Yo, Jody Watley, Khalees. Will Downing, you know? So it's like, you know, <laughs> so they've all just been wonderful uh, to talk about, you know, Will Downing talked about, uh, you know, growing up in New York and, you know, what was happening in his career when he was sick and or just who taught him how to cook. And, you know, you always hear that story of who taught them how to cook. Uh, they were hanging out with their mom or in the kitchen or wh whatever the case may be, mimicking, whatever. And then you, I love hearing the stories of, you know, especially from those who immigrant or, uh, or maybe first generation of parents who immigrated over to the U.S., um, i.e. when we did our Haitian Heritage uh, Month. Uh, it's be a doctor, be a lawyer, be an engineer. And they're like, no, I want to be a chef, <laughs> you know, and follow their passion that way. So, you know, all of them, whether they're a singer or whatever, you know, food is always still that common bond because there's always some roots there. We all have food memories of growing up as a child. We all do so. Now, you, you got to paint the scene for me because it's not every day people get to talk to, uh, you know, Dr. Maya Angelou at the time. So I got to know, was it that she was sitting in this big chair and she said, come, baby, 
<laughs> let me tell you about these greens. Like, what, what was it? You got um, tell me. So I wish I could see her because at the time, this was probably like 2010 or so. So we didn't have Zoom or anything. I just had my recorder. And we were talking about her book, The Welcome Table, Hallelujah Table. And, um, you know, she was talking about how she entertains and the food that she um, prepares and her process of preparing it. And then I was saying, you know, sort of at the end, you know, you're like, I'm not worthy. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I think I said something like, I look forward to sharing your story with our readers. And she was like, I look forward to reading Cuisine Noir. And I'm just like, ah, <laughs> you know, just go crazy when you hear them repeat the name, you know, because we were, again, in our infancy uh, stages. And so to score an interview like that was just amazing, so. How did it feel when that story was released? You know, it feels good because you got something that's very unique. And that was really, again, early in just how we, I was telling these stories and how I wanted to shape them in my writing and my interview skills, right, has just grown over these last 12 years. And so now, as you know, you may think, oh, I should have asked that question. Or I would have did that differently or whatever the case may be. But when you release something like that, it's like, yes, you got something that's special um, and you can't wait to share it. So it's always just amazing. So amazing. And, and you know, so many people have interviewed her over her lifetime and have asked so many different things, but how many people have really talked to her about food in that way? I know we're going to leave the heavy stuff and we're going to talk about the fun stuff. That was fun for me because I wanted to hear how she talked about greens. Like anytime I hear her talk was iconic. Uh, I mean, <laughs> and she's, that she's lived, right? Um, yes. Just amazing. And then you're talking about something that just really is so much fun to talk about of how do you prepare your greens, right? What you using and what's the seasoning? Listen, um, you just got some <laughs> recipes from her. Cheese. So... I know you got some recipes from her in your back pocket somewhere. I'm gonna, I I'm gonna... wish, but I didn't. That's okay. Just the book. Just the book. We'll work on it. We'll work on it. <laughs> but you've collected all these stories. That's the main point of that is really just the depth, even in your emphasis of the work that you've done. And I've been in Clubhouse a lot of a lot of times, and your name will come up even when you weren't there. Oh, that's and, good to hear. Yes. And some people's like, hey, we don't know if you know, but Cuisine Noir is a space. And so uh -huh. one of the things that we want to talk about is say, hey, look at the work that you've done, even in your infancy. That's what blows my mind is just the things that you've done. And so doing this in a way to just celebrate those 12 years, celebrate all the people that you've talked to, the people that you've impacted, and now what's to come. So we talked about where Cuisine Noir has been. We talked about where you've been. But it's year 12. I know. Where are we going? <laughs> Where are we going? You know, one of the things that the pandemic sort of put a little damper on is, you know, definitely expanding me on the written word. So definitely mm. in, the, in the next year, look for more video content. You know, we've been really talking about that. Um, we've talked about audio content. So we know those are the spaces that we want to move into next um, because people are not necessarily reading all the time. They want to listen. They want to watch. So we get that. So we're moving into that space. Also through the nonprofit that publishes Cuisine Noir, the Global Food and Drink Initiative, you know, we really want to be, like you said earlier, earlier, you know, this ecosystem of information, that's where we are. That's what we've always done. You know, our tagline is connecting the African diaspora through food, drink, and travel. And that's what we've been able to do for the last 12 years. So if you didn't know about these winemakers, let's connect you to them. These food trucks through the story, let's connect you to them. Who's doing what? That's what we're here to read and connect. And so through uh, GFDI, we want to make sure that we are just a global health, not health, but um, global hub for information um, that if you're looking, you know, we have parents to say, my son or daughter wants to go to culinary school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what is the decision? Is there, there's a chef that has spent the 50, 60, 70, $80,000 on culinary school. Then you have some of them that have just went to the school of hard knocks right. and they're still a darn good chef to this day, you know? Um, and so what, looking at the various stages or, op or options, how do you choose the one that's best for you? Is it going to a community college? And then from there you get your externship. 
and then you work, you know? So what is the best? So that, again, we wanna help you be able to, to make those informed decisions. Um, what type of food do you create? Do, you know, all of that business. Do I need a food truck or do I need a brick and mortar? Well, what, there's a lot of things behind that. Make sure you have the knowledge and the education mm -hmm. to know which way to step into. We know that with the pandemic, a lot of people will, will put like this, everybody was caught off guard, right? But when your business was not in order, that darkness came to light. And so that's one of the things that really needs to happen. I'm hoping that everyone said, you know what, if I didn't have business insurance, I got it now. If, mm -hmm. you know, I got my savings, you know, whatever the case may be, I don't care how much we're making, if we're tight, 10% needs to go into reserve, whatever the case may be. Uh, I'm really hoping because unfortunately, and not that I want to put anything out there, but you know, hope it probably will be another pandemic hopefully in our lifetime, but something else may come up. And are you prepared in business, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so that's the main thing. So again, those experts, I know um, a couple of businesses said, you know what, because we owned the building that we operate out of, that saved us. Mm -hmm. I think of those who, you know, we have one story coming out on an upcoming issue where she was saying that the landlord just kept pound, you know, you know, asking for the money, asking for the rent. And there was a moratorium going on, but the landlord was still asking for the, more, the rent, you know? So, you know, just different things that, you know, be able to make some really great decisions that are going to last for years and years and years. And then the other thing is, What's your plan? Is it a legacy business or are you going to sell it? And that's, mm. a, and that's for any business, right? Good are you passing too. it down from the next generation? You know, one of the generational businesses, as we know, um, are restaurants and wineries. Um, so just, you know, be able to, to have that in mind of what are you going to do with your business so you can move forward appropriately. So again, just really trying to offer those tools and resources um, in one place so that people can really move about in these spaces um, effectively and successfully. And it's needed, right? Because I mean, you and I have had conversations um, last year about the need for insurance, the need mm -hmm. for protection. Um, I can even think about on my podcast, I interview food trucks that they tend to pay a lot of money on a deposit for certain events like um, mm -hmm. South by Southwest and things of that nature. And they had never canceled in the past. So they knew, okay, as long as we make our deposit, we get in there, we do what we do. We're going to be good. We're going to mm -hmm. make our money back. Well, COVID happened. They canceled. They postponed it first. Then they canceled. They lost those deposits. There were events that deposits back. a lot of people lost their deposits. So that's, that's one of the things that I was so grateful that I had an opportunity to talk to him about is because since he didn't have, I, I what was like a, a event insurance or event protection because he didn't have that he could not get reimbursed for his deposit. And these mega, these mega um, festivals, sometimes you're putting down $5,000, $10,000. So you're in the hole that way. And wow. more people need to know about that. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to underscore something you said earlier about the power of not just Cuisine Noir, but the Global Food and Drink Initiative to connect people. And this is something I hadn't shared with you prior, but this is a direct result of Cuisine Noir. So my second magazine article uh, about two Nashville food trucks, uh, you know, supporting one another, supporting the community, Patrick Lanier, yes. the owner of Lip Smack and Creations Food Medic, he called me last year, uh, almost a year to this day in October, I, I asked his permission to record it. And he called me to say that, you know, things that happened in his life where he had lost the job that he was working for around his birthday and things were looking hard. And he got a call to come out to the motorsports way out in Tennessee. And he parks his food truck there. And it's this whole demographic that he wouldn't think initially would come to him, like these older white men, all this type of stuff. And every person that walked up to his truck said that they heard his story or they read his story in your magazine Shut and it was up. it was enough for him to keep going so now that's what he's doing full time pretty much is that food truck so in the middle of a pandemic by letting me create a space where I could share his story with Cuisine Noir that's what kept that truck open and oh kept it going my god. oh my god yes mm. well yes. oh wow you know and I don't you it's so I'll be honest with you it is 
some days are tough because you don't know of the, not, not that you're saying you, I don't want to say this, you know, sometimes if you're saying something and you're hearing no, 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 or you're having a bad day, yeah. sometimes you'll be like, what am I doing this for? You know what I mean? Yeah. Or you'll be, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There are people you interview and they just act like, you know, oh, you know, and it's just yeah. like, you know, so you, you get some that are really appreciative and you get some that are just so like, you know, they, they don't even list us as being interviewed by. And, yep. and you see that and it's just like, wow. But I know that people have seen this and, and not everybody's going to say, I read about you in Cuisine Noir. Not everybody's going to say that. And we don't, and that's totally fine. You know what I mean? So when you hear stuff like that, it's like, wow. You know, I remember um, I was, it was 20, 15, it was before the National Museum of African American History and Culture opened in DC. And it was November. And I was sitting at my desk and something was going on. Maybe I was trying to sell ads or something and the day just was not going well. And it was one of, one of those, what am I doing type of days. And I remember getting the email from the Smithsonian Channel saying that they wanted to commission our 2014 cover, Chef Joe Randall, into the, into the museum. And I was like, oh my, you know, it was that. So sometimes those are things that keep you going and people don't know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Again, it's not about, you know, praises or whatever, but you know, when you've got a mix of people that are unappreciative for what you do for them, and then you got the mix of people who are, it just, it really just, and I know you need to focus more on the people that appreciate it. I know that, but sometimes a bad egg gets in there, you know, yeah. but it, um, it really does make a difference. I know there was a chef in St. Lucia and he kept saying that a chef in Detroit read the article and uh, the, the chef in Detroit read the article, told his owner, and then the owner flew to St. Lucia. And wow. then he said, you know what? There, are four, there were four African-American diners that came in and they referenced that they read about you, and, uh, me and Cuisine Noir. So, you know, our influence is there. And so when I hear stories like this, I'm like, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Even, oh, that's uh, so good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. Yes. It, it was, it was that story. And, you know, even yesterday when I went down to Indy to see the taco lady and I was mm -hmm. talking to her, she was, I said, did you see the magazine? She was like, yeah. She said, I got a lot of business off of that. She was like, my aunties and them in California, they saw the story. Oh. So that oh. means a lot. Thank you. It wow. means a lot. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, 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 those are stories that are so wonderful to hear. It's, it's really like fuel to keep you going on those when you have those bad days um it just keeps you going because you know i look at this this is history um because there wasn't this history out there before you're seeing it even more you know tony tipton martin does a great mm -hmm. job therese black culinary history um you know uh, kevin mitchell chef joe randall uh jessica b harris you know they're doing a lot to really chronicle the, the story, especially before our generation, right? And so now even generations behind us can look back and say, oh, we made wine, we made beer, we made this, we did that, um, because we didn't have those stories, That's right. you know, as we were growing up. You know, I didn't have wine in my house. My dad was Puerto Rican rum. That's what we had, you know? Um, and, and I didn't really have my first wine until in my thirties, you know? And so now just want kids, I was saying today, I went, you know, we were picking uh, Cabernet grapes with a, a girlfriend of mine who's trying to make wine at home. And I said, you know what, your kids need to be out here. My nephews need to be out here. Um, and just, we were, went through, we were looking for the great, the best grapes and we were picking them to put into the bucket for her to make her wine. You know, that's like culture. That's not labor to that point. I know some people really, you know, cause it, it, trust me, we were out there at 6.30 and the sun was starting to get out there by 8, 8.30. It's like, wow, we see why they were like, we're going to get here early before the sun comes up. Um, but that's, to your point, exposure, exposure. And hopefully we can expose people to things that we're doing. Yes, we travel internationally. Yes, we ski. We ski. We surf. Call it textured waves. Girlfriend, Santa Cruz, surf. You know, we, we dive. We do all this stuff. You know, oh, some of us are lying in our hair wet, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so 
though, again, just those negative misperceptions about who we are as a people. We have disposable income to travel, to do things, you know? So, so that's been the joy of really uh, being able to, to, and to lead the conversations. Cause let me say this, I know everyone is on this performative kick now of now I wanna feature more black stories um, after what happened last year. But as I say before, everybody that we feature has been out there. They were not hidden. It's just a matter of if you wanna tell those stories or not. I'm so, so happy that you said that because some of my pet peeves over this past year were hearing of these following phrases, giving voice to the voiceless, um, <laughs> uncovering this story or like they've been telling it. Have you been listening? They have, have you ever cared to listen beforehand? No, nope, they didn't. And, and that is, the proof is in the pudding there where last year you kept hearing a lot of Black writers or reading a lot of Black writers on Twitter like, oh, I pitched that story two years ago and I just got an email from a, an editor asking me, like, you remember that story? You know, we, I had a, a couple of writers on my team was like, oh, I pitched this story or whatever this opportunity a couple of years ago and I'm, now I'm being contacted. It was like, you know, I just... So that is one thing that we're proud of. We've always been doing that, you know, and I'll say this about my team. We, we cover the stories that we cover, but my team is diverse and it has yes. been from the ground one. The designers are white. I have white writers, South Pacific Asian writers, black writers, Latino writers. That has never been, you know, you, I, the thing is you got to tell the person's story, let them tell their story. That's what we talk about. But we've always been, from an editorial team standpoint, has always been, you know, built from that standpoint, diverse mm -hmm. uh, and inclusive standpoint. So, you know, like I said, I just, when I, as a media person and what was happening in mm -hmm. media, media, I, I was just like, at first I'll have to say, do we do what you, and I was like, and then I stopped and said, you know what, you do nothing. You've been doing this. Mm -hmm. You've been doing this. So there's, so there's no, you know, they're trying to come up and make all these staff changes and editorial changes. Unfortunately, they have more money than I do. And I can't, you know, maybe, you know, innovate as quickly as we would like to challenges of being black media, you know, but we've all, I'm proud to say that we've always stood on the stories that we've told. Even when people have said, well, why don't you open up your focus? I said, no, I want to talk about black people. <laughs> there we go. And that's where I stood and that's where I stand. Cause we're, we're just so diverse and beautiful as it is, you know? So not only, you, I mean, I can talk about diverse, we speak English, Spanish, French, I mean, Russian, Japanese, Chinese. There we go. So, you know, I got, I got a lot to explore right here and, and share, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Because we need spaces like that. You know, we need to see the diversity within ourselves. You know, a lot of times I get overplayed, overruled, and I'm grateful that Cuisine Noir has been a space that has said, no, 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 Black is diverse. It takes every color to make Black in the first place. And we come in every color, too. That part. I know, so. That part. And so when we're talking about Black media and we're talking about support, you know, you've done so much in the past 12 years, but there's also so much more that can be done. And it's time for us to support the vision. You know, you've, it, it's, it's not just me saying it. I mean, you can find writers that I've connected to that I haven't met in person, but we connected because they saw I was a writer at Cuisine Noir and yes. we found that out on Clubhouse. And we're like, oh, Cherie has been so supportive. Cuisine Noir has been in this space. So also I say lovingly that you've had our back for a long time. So we also want to have your back. And so how can we, support what GF, uh, GFDI and Cuisine Noir is doing? How can we do that? Awesome. So we, um, so as we form, so to your point of support, last year, long story short, I was wrecking my brain up against 
you know, I just, I just threw down my pencil and said, this game of advertising is just tough because the brands that we support just do not support black media back. They don't. They don't mind taking our dollars as consumers. And so that's where we need to be more conscious about where, who is spending with us back. Um, but I said, you know what? I need to look at a different model. As everybody was making, a lot of people were making pivots last year. And our pivot was our media nonprofit so that we could be able to diversify the support that was coming in. It couldn't just be on advertising and um, sponsorships alone anymore. So we formed our nonprofit, the Global Food and Drink Initiative. So this month for our 12 year anniversary, we're asking everybody to donate $12 or more um, and that goes toward the work that we're doing. You know, we have our team of, we have staff that we pay here. So it's not like, um, you know, we're working hard to really be able to, you know, make sure our team is consistent. We're putting out consistent content every week and we want to grow to the next level. And that's going to take more support from everybody, uh, which we would love. So again, if you go on, you can go two places, either cuisinenoirmag.com or the global, globalforgood.org, you'll see donate and you'll be able to make a donation. You know, we are pending on our status, which we'll have um, next month, but the IRS does go back 27 months from the time of our approval. So the, the um, donations will be by the end of this year tax deductible. Um, and again, just all the support to keep telling these stories, keep yeah. telling. Absolutely. And also those links will be in the comments, um, in the comment box description here on YouTube. So you won't have to go far yeah. for that. We, we definitely want to make sure that this is a vision that is supported and continues to grow and expand um, simply because, I mean, I can't imagine what the food scene with the food media scene would look like had you not stepped into it I mean we got to do more work about honoring the way it's been paid you know as a food content creator in many spaces as a podcaster I got contemporaries that I can look to but also and we do a good job of, of doing that to some extent we also got to look and say but if it wasn't for this place where would I have heard that story where right. would I've gotten to know like I would have never known about black food trucks in France in Paris specifically, had it not oh, been the one from Senegal, she's um, Senegalese. Yep, yep, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Would have never known about it. Mm -hmm. I still remember the image she had on the black hat yep. with, the, yep. <laughs> with the cutout tank top. I would have never known that story if it wasn't for Cuisine Noir tagging me in in Instagram. Dang. You know, I'm excited. I almost say it's almost like our little Richard moment or whatever, but. You know, honestly, we really did pioneer these conversations. You had your lifestyle magazines that were, had food here and there inserted, right? Mm -hmm. But no one had these food stories 100% of the time. And we look at how we influence, you know, the content, the programming at festivals, a lot of things we've influenced and come along. Um, the way. And so that is to be proud. I was sharing that, you know, we came up with the very first, to our knowledge, Black wine list in 2010. Wow. 2010, when we started tracking Black winemakers. Um, and then last year, all of these lists started coming out, right? Um, but 2010 is when we made the first list for people to know who Black wineries were and where they were so that they can go and patronize them. And the great thing is that list has just grown. I mean, we just, let me see, there's a winery that popped up in New York. There's brands popping up all the time. And so we'll be, we have our directory online, which I need to update because there's so many wineries that are coming up, which is great. Um, you know, and it is funny because you know, Iris Rado sold her winery. Mm -hmm. And then there was another winery in um, Virginia and they sold theirs. So it was Wisdom Oak, Jerry Bias. And I remember the, the company, well, at least definitely with Jerry Bias, the company had reached out to me mm -hmm. and I think they wanted me to take the article down because he was no longer the owner of that winery. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, no, 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 we will not because he made an impact in this industry and his story when he was the owner still needs to be told. Now, what I will do 
is I will note that he no longer owns the winery at the bottom of the article and provide an update, just like I, you know, I didn't tell her this, but just like I did with Iris Bordeaux, but I'm not going to take that story down. That's history. Mm. So they were okay with that, but I was like, nope, mm -mm. I'm not taking mm. it down. And now you see, and, and this is the thing is that, well, a lot of people don't understand. It's not just a magazine. This is an archive. Mm -hmm. As a researcher, trying to find information about black owned food trucks and all this different type of thing, when it's not in the museums, like I haven't seen a food truck museum just yet. If it is oh, one, oh, I need to be the curator. Vision, girl, put the vision. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like, but those stories had been collected in that way. So I had to turn to social media. I had to turn to different articles that may have been written by different journalists to find out these stories. And what you have is so much more than a, a, a magazine. It's really an archive. It's a museum that said, hey, these people live, they breathe, this is what they made, this is what they did, this is the impact that it's had. This is how it's revolutionized this culinary industry before we have situations where different food gets commodified before right. it gets claimed and said oh well this person really took it and made and elevated it no this was a person that started the movement and they were black so before it gets taken before it gets erased before it gets whitewashed whatever mm -hmm. we have the record that shows who these people were and what they did absolutely absolutely so no, I love what you said. We definitely are an archive and that's where I want us to remain for, for generations to come. For my great nephews that are like one, one of my babies, one, three, and six. Oh, my little sure. nephew is seven. Now they have things that they can go back to and read and, and know their history, the greatness. Um, and the other thing I want to point out too is it's wonderful seeing, I know Chef Joe Randall, who's been over 50 years in the game. So his generation is the Edna Lewis, the Patrick Clark, the, um, Leah Chase, that, you know, that generation there. You know, he was saying that around the civil rights when, you know, we were able to, you know, we rights and then it was become a lawyer, a doctor, you know, all of that stuff. No, again, no different than what families will share when they come over here from immigration and then they share with their children. It's the same thing. Everybody wants to look at those those jobs, right? That make mm -hmm. the money, right? Um, but people just wanna cook and they know that that feeds the soul and there's so much there. And so I say that to say there's so much pride, good pride in being a chef nowadays. You know, it's looked upon differently than what it was looked upon years and years ago, right? Um, you know, it's not like we have to be in the kitchens anymore. We want to be there. We want to create. We love the flavors. We love the ingredients. Um, I mean, it's like, wow, where did all this come from? This abundance of the earth, you know, thank you, Lord, you know? Um, and so it's a different story. So again, to see chefs, just especially on Instagram, just really blooming in what they love to do, it's just, it's, it's great. It's, it's definitely a different story again than 20, 30 years ago or more ago, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because, you know, food, the kitchen, all of that, for many Black people, that was our lab when they didn't want us to be scientists. Mm -hmm. That was our museum when they wouldn't feature our art. That was our space to do books when they wouldn't let us be published authors. We wrote the cookbooks and the recipes. Uh, wow. That was where we could do all the things that we wanted to do when we were shut out of those spaces. And so... Um, I genuinely want to say thank you for allowing that to continue to be a space where they can still be scientists, they can still be artists, they can still be historians. So yes. I want to say thank you to you and to your team. Thank you. For making that yes. Wonderful team. Love my team. Great team. Great team. So for everybody, I just want to say once again, if you didn't know who Cherie Williams is, <laughs> you best know by now. <laughs> Uh, I sincerely, I want to make sure that first of all, you're going to cuisinewarmag.com that you are not, yes, I want you to donate, do that. Send them $12, 1200, 12 million, all of that. Send all of that. <laughs> send all the 12s your way. Exactly. But Love also send, send the coins, the, the dollars, <laughs> the checks, the PayPal's, all of it. 
But at the same time, I really want you to spend time and immerse yourself in the stories that are there. Shameless plug to my two articles, yes. <laughs> but also <laughs> immerse yourself in these stories. And you said right before we closed, Sheree, you talked about the, the print edition. So can you talk a little yes. bit more about that? Yes, I'm sure that real fast. So excited to um, do a special edition print issue. I'm not gonna reveal who's on the cover. You're gonna have to follow some social media on September 21st. Um, but it is someone that you, um, if you're following headlines and sure. what's going on and her YouTube show, um, I won't say anymore. Um, <laughs> many of us grew up watching her. So we're excited to have her on the cover. But most importantly, this issue focuses on stories of how we pull through as Black people around the diaspora through the pandemic. So we talked to a restaurateur in Salvador de Bahia. We talked to uh, tr people in Trinidad, Jamaica. We've talked to Can Canadians, people in the US about their stories and how they made that pivot to survive this pandemic, the impact and how they survived it. So excited for it to come out. We got some new recipes, some cocktails in there, some products. So it's going to be a great issue. So we're going to pre-launch it um, September 21st. Okay. Anyone who makes a donation will get a complimentary copy that will be mailed out in October. And it's definitely going to be an issue that you want to have. Because again, these stories won't be told anywhere else. Um, we will have partner locations. So you'll know partner locations between the U.S. and uh, Canada where you can pick that up. You'll be able to order it directly on Cuisine Noir. And then for those who love digital, it will be on issue. And also for our international audience, it will be on issue. So, so we've definitely this time around expanded our, our reach. So our goal too, when you talk about things to come, we're looking at a biannual print issue. Mm -hmm. um, we love the reach of digital. Um, and also too, it's so funny because these stories are so good but I only have certain space and I'm like, oh, I got to cut this. Whereas on digital, it's just like, let it roll. So that's the other thing that we do love about digital is we don't have to cut these stories because uh, print will do that to you, the space constraint. So anyway, amazing issue, pre-sale out September 21st. So you're going to get some coins from me because I won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to get mine and I want all of you to get your copy Make sure that, hey, buy some for your friends, for your aunties and them. You know, you always got that grandma that like to read everything. I know my great grandma likes to read. So I'm buying a copy for her. So make sure that you have, this is something that you can pass on to people. This is a record. I keep saying archive. It's not just because I'm an academic, but it's also because I'm very passionate about seeing things that we can pass down for memories about what the culture is, what it's always been and what it's gonna be. So make sure that you purchase some copies. It's going to an absolutely amazing cause that has done so much to preserve culture and to share culture. And so Sheree, once again, I wanna say thank you for thank stopping you. by. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for being a great supporter um just love you know just connecting with such amazing people and again giving you your flowers congratulations on your upcoming your third season upcoming fourth season of the fruit truck scholar i mean thank you for giving voices there and just really telling those stories and so yes we have to plan a food truck tour there you go <laughs> with some wine attached to it um so see it in the future but yeah thank you so much so Absolutely. It has been my pleasure. And I'm holding it, you to it. I'm, I okay. got a wine glass from Dollar Tree ready. <laughs> <laughs> but don't, hey, why are you joking? A friend of mine went to one of the Dollar Trees here in California, got the cutest wine. They were the stemless mm -hmm. and they were like, it's wine time or whatever. So don't don't be missing out on the Dollar Store. I'm not missing out. I'm telling you what's in my cabinet. I ain't missing out on nothing. <laughs> Love it. Love it.